Today, we're taking a look at all five gigs in the bustling heartland of Night City to determine what hidden secrets and references lie beneath the surface. The city centre is rife with corporate conspiracies, shady deals, and outright terrible people. And believe me, Tombs, some of these really do stretch into mini quest lines in and of themselves. So, without further ado, let's dive right in to the gigs of Dino Dinovic and what they have to offer. Dino's first gig for us is called A Lack of Empathy, a sabotage mission which takes place within the Empathy Club, a place we'll actually come to as Johnny during his mental night out inhabiting V's body. Now, this place was co-founded by two guys named Adam Ibrahimovic and Larry Fanghorn. The two ran the club in perfect harmony, it seems, until one day Adam decided to seize full control, kicking Larry out, changing the access codes, and hiring the animals for security. So, Larry did the one thing which appears to get the desired results in Night City and contacted a fixer, Dino. Not Dino. I think somebody told me off for calling him Dino before, so I hear. Dino then hatched a plan. Hack into the club systems, bring Biz to a total standstill, until Adam cuts Larry back into the fold. Of course, given the nature of all systems in 2077 operating on their own isolated subnets, that's where we come in. To infiltrate the club, and infect it with a black market demon. There's also a bonus for doing this one stealthily, which is worth it for the extra challenge, though the bonus itself is, well, completely laughable. Now, the most obvious way of doing this is to come through the front entrance, where a dude's complaining that the club isn't a full-on brothel. I heard this was a fun club. I can offer you a booth with a private dance, or a hard BD. Excellent choices, both. I want the real deal, not some shitty virtue. Getting in this way though, we'll be forced to deposit all of our weapons, which for non-netrunners, that may prove a problem. Though engaging in stealth is the only way to complete this mission fully successfully anyway. But there's a far more straightforward couple ways in than this. Come around the block to the back of the club, and we'll be able to enter via the fire escape without depositing our weapons. Or, if you literally want to circumvent all challenge for this gig, jump to the upper fire escape and enter via the server room directly. Upload the virus, and leave back the way you came. If you're quick, you can get it done before the one guy in here even finishes his phone call. However, doing it this way, you'll miss out on a few bonuses littered about the rest of the club, including, as usual, some wider context to the situation. On this terminal, behind where we deposit our weapons, we can read that Adam has actually been receiving threats from Dino on Larry's behalf, and knowing the type of guy Dino is, is actually running shit scared. He's posted extra guards monitoring for specific activity, and has even been tipped that Dino recently purchased a black market demon. That'd be the one we're uploading to his system. Now, there's actually another terminal entry we can find called My Club, recounting the entire conversation between Dino and Larry. Turns out, Dino agreed to help Larry out only on the basis that he received 10% of Larry's monthly income thereafter, but he'll throw in his own hustle to stop anything like this from happening again. However, I reckon Dino didn't pursue helping Larry out here as the only option, with another email between him and Adam involving Dino demanding eddies from him with three days to pay up. My guess is that Dino went to whichever of the two would line his pockets the best. I mean, fair enough, I can think of few fixes that wouldn't do the same. Elsewhere of note around the club is the animal's head of security, extremely hungover, and who could be taken out secretly when he goes into the bathroom to sober up. Though be careful how you do this one, since it can trigger the entire club into combat if not timed well. Also in the dancers dressing room, we can get a few comments from the dancers. She knew or something? If she is, I don't see the appeal. Don't worry, she got nothing on you or me. Also in here are two more readable emails. First is a guy named George Svensson threatening Adam with legal action for allegedly spiking his drink, emptying his cred ship, and kicking him out of the club. It seems George's threats didn't come to fruition though, guess he no longer had the money to pay his lawyers. And it's clear from an assault in progress over here that Adam really isn't afraid to use lethal force on anybody who doesn't play by his rules. After firing this guy, Chubby Chip, Chip left the club with a few swiped BDs and no back pay. When threatened by Adam, he retaliated saying he'd go to the NCPD, with the docs proving Adam screwed over Larry, for which Adam had him hunted down and murdered to death. Damn, this guy's a piece of work. One of the most interesting tidbits back on this terminal here though is an email from Gottfried and Frederick Person, the awful XBD editors from that harrowing dirty biz gig up in Northside. Now, they insisted back then that they purely edit XBDs, receiving them through dead drops and never having any contact with who makes them, a fact which in their eyes apparently 
apparently makes what they're doing more okay. This, in and of itself though, is a lie, as evidenced by the fact that they're requesting more XBDs from certain stars under Adam's employ, even offering aid to make them power through whatever screwed up shit these poor guys are subjected to. Clearly, Gottfried and Frederick have far more stake in this awful industry than they made out, and really are pure evil. What's more, it's clear that this unsavory Adam character is also mixed up with that industry, though the fact that Dino was prepared to have him keep running the club for the right price, well, it merely proves that in Night City, nobody's hands are totally clean, with everybody working in this fragile ecosystem to perpetuate the good and mostly evil which comes out of this place, including us, no doubt. One thing's for certain though, this future is morally fucked beyond all recognition. As for this gig, it's got a cool setting, and even digs its way into some of the grittier elements of this world. So for that, I award it an A tier. An inconvenient killer is a term used to describe a fellow merc for hire named Jack Mouser. Now, unlike some mercs who do the job and do it well in order to secure the highest payouts, Jack is more a man who just wants to watch the world burn. In his last op, tasked with stealthily clapping some shards from a Zeta Tech convoy, he instead killed everyone there and blew up the transport. So, not wanting Zeta Tech to come down hard on him for arranging the op, Dino is hoping that having Mouser taken out will act as a peace offering to them of sorts. Problem is, Mouser Mouser is locked up tight inside his club, Seventh Hell, and is refusing to come out even for more gigs. The only option then is to send us inside the club and take the guy out on his home turf. Now, there's two ways inside this place, either pay 500 eddies to the bouncer out front, unless you're a street kid and can haggle your way in for free, or with a high enough tech skill, you can get inside the maintenance elevator and enter via the back door. There's a bonus to this gig for not getting into combat, and you can wander around most of the club without any issues. Be sure not to miss this obscure door to the basement, down which I found a rare piece of legendary clothing. Now, we'll figure out the best way to Mouser in just a moment, but first, by reading any of the various terminals around the club, we can get some flavouring as to the type of guy Mouser really is. Just look at this email he sent to all his new employees upon buying the club. He immediately cuts basic things like sick leave, halves lunch to half an hour, and takes full control of any tips. Nice boss to work for, and for all that cracking down on his operation, he still can't even afford to pay for his speaker set for the club. As we can see, the company Soundpound, who provided the speakers, are now threatening him with legal action. If we ask Johnny, he's making poor use of those speakers anyway. Sweet Jesus, you hear that? Do you hear what they're playing? Each to their own, Johnny. That's what peeps with bad taste always say. Don't know what he did to deserve what's coming, but his music taste is reason enough to drop it. Not gonna lie, it may be each to their own, but when a club's as dead as this, it's probably a sign you should adapt your business strategy. I think Jack's probably more cut out for chaotic merc work and not running a club. In fact, he tries to treat the unpaid speakers issue by hiring a merc to go and threaten the company. We can find an email about this between him and Tiny Mike from the Concrete Cage Trap gig, though Mike turns Jack down on account of having another job to go to already. No doubt the one which will lead to our paths crossing back in Kabuki. In addition to this, Jack Mouser also got offered a gig by our pal Padre, the Gustavo Auto one in fact, which we instead carried out back down in Hayward. Jack though turned it down on account of quote, not looking to step on any Valentino toes, end quote. Interesting that Jack opts to pick a fight with Zeta Tech, but not the Valentinos. I mean, the Tinos are formidable, I'm not disputing that, it's just that a Megacorp is obviously formidable too. I think this guy's a little off the rails, and no wonder, considering all the substances he seemed been given by Bartolomeo Mordellini. Now, there's a guy with a lot of underlying presence in this game, who you'd expect to take center stage in his own specific gig or side quest or something, but no, he's just kind of there, in the background of scanner hustles and briefly in the bar during the heist. I'll do a video covering him at some point, but basically he's famed for having wild boat parties full of sex and drugs, and we can even see he procured glitter from the lab we blew up during the Heisenberg Principle in Little China. Jack being pals with him then would no doubt explain the being a bit of a loose cannon thing a little more. Now, there's a few ways to get to Mouser, though if you're going for the avoiding combat bonus, then there is one in particular which stands out as best. Bear in mind, you could equally just take the guy out from afar, but the diplomatic option is only unlocked by confronting him in his office. To get there, without going through guards, then you'll want to come to this security office upstairs, sneak past or take out the workman, then head up into this maintenance hatch. 
match. Conveniently, the staging serves as a perfect walkway allowing us to reach Mouser's ensuite bathroom, which, as you would expect, does not have a guard posted outside. It's creative, it's espionage, and I love it. What the? Who the fuck are you? How'd you get in here? Quiet down, or I'll have to cut our convo short. Oh, I get it. Got a bounty on my head, have I? Who hired you? Militech? Asukaga? Or was it that wanker, Dino? I gotta say, of all the people we've been sent to neutralize for these gigs, Jack Mouser is without a doubt one of the most mouthy. Or perhaps I should say, mousy? And out of everyone we can allow to walk away, I certainly wouldn't say he's one of the most innocent. He's brutally, and I mean really brutally, killed hundreds of people, not that we haven't done the same, and he also treats his workers like complete horseshit. Even here, he immediately squares up for a fight, with the diplomacy of the situation being entirely put forward by V. If you just want to do the job by the book on this one, I really don't blame you. There's a strong argument that the world would be a better place. However, if for whatever reason you think this guy deserves a second chance, I don't know, maybe there's a little reflection of V in there somewhere, then we can, with a little convincing, make Mouser leave Night City instead. Likely, this precipitates a lie to the corpse that Mouser is in fact dead, though it seems moments after this encounter he also contacted Dino to make him aware of the situation. Something that Dino is remarkably okay with, seeming no, more than that, he's actually impressed at our skills of persuasion, deeming the problem just as resolved. Again, set it with previous gigs, but it's nice that most of the time at least, diplomacy is very much an option. Even with the shitbags who really probably don't deserve that chance, it's yet another reminder that the cyberpunk setting is definitely one of the most morally grey. And for this well thought out and nuanced gig, I award it another A tier. A fairly speedy, but enjoyable gig next, this one is set down in the end cart station directly below the city centre roundabouts. Now, whilst the gig itself is only small, it does allude to a somewhat wider corporate conspiracy which definitely feels right at home in this world. You see, Zola Barnes was a journalist who tragically wound up falling onto the tracks of the end cart station recently, with officials ruling the act as deliberate. Problem is, Zola is merely one in a long line of suspicious deaths like this, and what's more, Militech have now occupied the premises for some reason, wiped clean the security footage, and convinced all witnesses to the event to keep their mouths shut. Of course, as we know, wiped footage doesn't necessarily mean fully wiped, yet. So, Dino has tasked us with infiltrating the station's security, clapping whatever data's left, and getting the hell out of there. There's a couple ways to do this, as usual. One front door, a back door, or what I'd personally go with, a ceiling vent. Doing it this way, we can drop down right outside a cell to witness this guy getting beaten up by Militech security, and if we're quick enough, we can not only save the dude, but we'll also be able to question him as well. I didn't see or hear nothing, I swear. Why was he beating on you? Because he's a fucking psycho like all the rest of them. Thank Christ you came. Taught him a lesson. Not that he really sheds anything more of note on the situation, but cool detail. Now, come downstairs and in this chest here is a legendary NCPD ballistic vest. Very nice, because legendary clothing is pretty rare in this game. What's more, reading the terminal where we collect the data, it looks like Night City Council have been attempting to subcontract somebody into completing the line to Pacifica, with a deadline of 240 days to do so. Now, whilst end cart tunnels I think were a plan which got abandoned quite early into development, the fact that this may be getting underway, coupled with with how Phantom Liberty is set to expand Pacifica, this does make me wonder, especially with the whole spy espionage theme, whether we'll be getting much in the way of missions set down in these tunnel systems. Hell, maybe come the time of Phantom Liberty, the tunnels would still be incomplete, makes sense, and thus we'd be freely able to walk through them without the fear of also suffering Zola Barnes's fate. I want to believe you, Francis. This whole gig, by the way, if you didn't realise, is a pretty on-the-nose reference to Season 2 of House of Cards, with the event and the names being a nod. Zola Barnes is of course a play on Zoe Barnes, and she was writing a piece on a councilman named Brad Norwood, a play on Frank Underwood, and if the events of the show were anything to go by, it was he who pushed her onto the tracks. Hopefully, with this footage, we can take this guy down before he, I don't know, becomes president of the NUSA or something, or gets done in real life for some criminal things, who knows? Mind you, I 
I bet Dino would probably prefer to use the footage as leverage than outright getting justice for someone. In fact, Dino wanted this footage so much that before us, he actually hired a Netrunner, who we can find at this assault in progress, to originally hack the footage from up the road. Case mod can sadly be found surrounded by Militech drones. It seems these guys really were taking this event pretty seriously. Luckily though, we're made of tougher stuff, and having made our way in, it's merely a case now of getting out again. Exiting the station, I also came across this shard, claiming Militech's lengthy occupation of the place was due to dealing with Zola's remains right along the tracks. Quite why they need fully geared military squads to deal with that is, well, it's quite obviously a cover-up as we know. And this little homage to a shocking House of Cards plot thread does slot in pretty perfectly in this game, making it, in my book, a B-plus tier gig. This one has, shall we say, an interesting premise. See, Eva Cole prides herself on being something of an anti-corpo counsellor, constantly blocking their nefarious deeds with witnesses, penalties, red tape, etc. Not necessarily a terrible human, if you ask me. I mean, it's way too easy as it is for corpos in this city to get away with all kinds of atrocities. The corpos themselves, not being happy about this however, have contacted Dino to hire us to acquire some dirt on the woman, and her job being stressful and all, she unwinds by night on her yacht in the marina by engaging in a hefty number of quote unquote wild f fests. No doubt if that footage saw the light of day, Eva would be a little more cooperative when it came to letting corpos off the leash. We then are tasked with infiltrating the marina, remaining undetected, then hacking into and stealing the footage from her boat, which, if we check its name on the security terminal, is brilliantly called Boaty McBoatface Jr. and is actually owned by presumably her husband, Christian Cole. We also have the likes of Otterly Fabulous III and Seal of Trust. Somebody at CDPR is really into their puns, clearly, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before heading to the security room itself, I'd suggest you first infiltrate Boaty McBoatface Jr. for a high-level item and a unique interaction with Johnny, who, despite knowing what's happened on board this thing, sits directly on the furniture. See, V, people in this city are eating out of tubes, sleeping rough in here. Golden shitters. Where's the shame? Where is the fucking shame? I don't know, Johnny. Let me just ask the next billionaire I bump into on the street. Tell him Johnny Silverhand asked. No need to ask anything. Just spit in their face. I mean, yeah, he's got a point, but at the same time, Eva Cole still sounds a hell of a lot better than most of the corpo swine in this city, actually going out of her way to make it harder for them to commit atrocities. I mean, maybe on a net balance, she's even doing some good. I don't know. And if at the end of the day, she needs to unwind from that with wet old old f fest on her yachts so that she can then get up in the morning and stick it to some more corpo big shots, then perhaps she may just be doing a bit more good for the world on balance than bad. But thanks to us, that's all set to change anyway. And it's kind of sad that there's no way out of this. Regardless of how our V feels towards the corporations, we do have to, in this instance, help them out. So back to that, the terminal we need is in this central building. And be warned, this place ain't exactly going light when it comes to security. You will have to be except exceptionally sneaky in order to get in and out of here undetected, and it is no doubt easier with optical camo as well as a Sandeviston or Cyberdeck, after which it is actually fairly straightforward. Of course, before clapping the footage, it's definitely worth having a review of the messages. Remember Bartolomeo Mordellini, mentioned back in Inconvenient Killer? Well, he's been causing quite a stir in the marina as of late, with his boat Gisha receiving multiple complaints of late night noise disruptions due to him hosting parties, which sounds remarkably similar to what Eva likes to get up to on her boat. Now, I don't know how, but I do kind of hope this guy gets a small role to play in Phantom Liberty at some point. A lot of underlying character groundwork has gone in here with subtle references, and it'd be a shame to waste him. So maybe he could show up at the casino or something? And with the footage clapped, that's it for this one. Make your way out again, stealthily, claim your measly reward if you were stealthy enough, and get ready for the final gig. Sadly, this one has little in the ways of references to other things, far as I can tell, save for of course Mordellini, though it is a cool setting, and provides a fair bit of challenge via the bonus objective. On balance then, I think we'll call it a B-, minus. but the lack of connections and wider references in this one are more than made up for, believe me, in the final City Centre gig. 
If Jitaro Shobo is the street-level goon and all-round terrible person whose name crops up literally everywhere, then Joanne Coke occupies that same role, albeit at a corpo level. Indeed, this gig is not merely a massive hotel infiltration and assassination job, but rather a culmination of countless scanner hustles, suspected crimes, and smaller bits dotted around Night City. But before we get into all that, let's first analyse the details of the gig at hand. Joanne Coke serves as the regional director for tech and development for Night City's branch of Bio Technica. You know, the huge stretch of greenhouse farms south of Pacifica. Lately, however, Duran has stirred up a whole lot of anger from the Red Ochre Nomad Clan. You see, Biotechnica are no strangers to using forgotten and destitute people as test subjects to further their scientific endeavours for quote unquote the betterment of humankind. At least the humankind who can afford to buy whatever medications they roll out. Problem is, what Duran doesn't understand is that nomad groups are one of the last surviving people in the world who live to the unbreaking code of taking taking care of their own. And this time, no less than 70 members of the Red Ochre clan have wound up dead thanks to Joran's nefarious experiments. And you know what they say, if we can't save the nomads then, well, you can be damn sure we'll avenge them. So that's the play. Red Ochre have hired us to infiltrate this corporate hotel, make our way to the 19th floor, and take out Coke. There's no stealth bonus for doing this, but trust me, this will go a lot smoother without the entire security of the hotel at our heels. So whilst we can freely enter the lobby, hell, we can even try to book a room with the receptionist to zero success, but getting in this way is not exactly straightforward. So I'd recommend coming around to one of the sides and entering via one of these two doors. The ground floor has a few corridors and Militech staff, not to mention a large central space. There's quite a number of robots on guard here, but luckily, so long as nobody is alerted to our presence, they'll remain dormant. We can also find a message about Dr. Coke's arrival with an order to shoot intruders on site. Business as usual then, I guess. Head to the upper floor and we'll find more dormant robots, as well as at the end a security room. Just a heads up, if Joanne gets her chance to flee, this is where she'll head to. So it's worth taking these guys out beforehand too, just in case. Inside the room is also a request from Joanne to be left undisturbed. Completely. Good to know. Finally, heading into Joanne's hotel apartment, I want to say, we can do this either through the front door, nice and simple, or heading to the roof and taking out four more guards, we can instead drop down via a skylight. Either way, Joanne will be sat here plugged into a brain dance and totally oblivious to our presence. So before we look this evil woman in the eye, we may as well look around some. There's some nice legendary items up here, as well as a terminal entry on Project Nightingale, the experiment in question which killed those red oak clan members. According to this, they were killed by electromagnetic overstimulation as well as experiencing symptoms like neuralgic growth. Now, someone with actual medical qualifications can no doubt explain what this means better than me, so correct me if I'm totally wrong, but it sounds like some form of electromagnetism caused severe nerve pain, which no doubt resulted not just in death, but excruciating death, come to that. So let's wake the woman up and tell her that Red Ochre is not happy. What? what? Who the hell are you? What you'd find more interesting is who sent me. Remember your little science experiment with the Red Ochre clan? The family send their regards. I, I do. I remember well. It was an integral stage in my research. Y you see, we're working on new antibiotic- Oh, please. Gonna feed me the story of how sacrifices must be made in the quest to save humanity? I'm not. I know people like you. Hired plenty myself. And I know you won't let me go, but, but at least let me back up the test results for future application. These nomads, they're gone regardless. Let their death serve a purpose. Okay, so spoiler alert, regardless of what we do here, Joanne will pointlessly attempt to flee, but just for the sake of it, let's go through every crime that we can find out about which this awful woman has committed. So first up, is this assault in progress also in city centre, where some mercs have taken out a journalist named Manuel Mendoza because he was investigating coke. Looks like there's no length this woman won't go to to keep Biotechnica's reputation in check. Reading the notes on Manuel's body, we come across some familiar 
names, or names that will be familiar in just a second. Amelia Morton, ex-Biotechnica, can also be found in the city centre down here. Joanne herself had directly hired the animals to take care of her, and reading the convo between the two on Amelia's body, it's clear as to just why. Amelia, it seems, disagreed with Joanne's poisoning of the Red Ochre Clan, and because of this, Joanne had her kicked from Biotechnica. So, in retaliation, Amelia was threatening to leak the incident to the press. This explains Joanne's somewhat elated and panicked state when we read the termination order she sent. As for the second guy in Manuel's notes, Darnell Arthur, I haven't come across him anywhere. Zoli Barnes, presumably that's a typo on Zola Barnes from the previous gig, so perhaps she was somehow mixed up in or investigating this too. And finally, Brandon Murphy can be found far out into the Badlands, where he was unfortunately waylaid by wraiths when attempting to leave Night City. We can learn that he did indeed meet with Mendoza, and the fact that he lets a member of Biotechnica know that this took place may have been what got Mendoza also killed. Brandon, you see, was a soldier for Biotechnica, but after being tasked with taking samples of the Red Ochre victims, he resultantly lost an arm. I don't blame him for losing all loyalty to the corporation at that point. Just a shame that he underestimated the harshness of the Badlands. Anyway, on Mendoza's notes we can also read just 12 of the 70 Red Ochre victims, giving but a taste of the atrocities which Coke committed. Also, whatever test she was doing sounds pretty horrific if it has the power to remove arms at just a touch. Makes me think of that scene in Chernobyl where the firefighters touch the graphite, you know? This isn't actually all though. Heading up to Norfolk to the assault in progress near this currently unavailable building, and we can find a woman named Diana Kuno, who also tried and failed to leave Night City. She was to serve as the scapegoat for all the casualties of Coke's experiments. Should it get out, then all the blame would be placed on her. They also had her executed, so she couldn't even protest. Diana pleaded for help from Wakako, who respectfully refused to get involved in what is shaping up to be a major corporate cover-up. Oh, and it turns out, even the Netrunner Mendoza mentions in his notes can also be found as part of a major link to this whole thing. One of the biggest suspected crime activities also up in North Oak involves infiltrating the Impala Automatics facility. Just outside, though, is the body of the Netrunner 00, who Mendoza hired to hack into Biotechnica's subnet. But reading shards inside the facility, it's clear that 00 was not only detected, but their presence was also directly reported to Coke. Indeed, it appears that Impala Automatics, as well as this entire crime activity too, is also directly tied to Biotechnica and Joanne Coke's experiments. And in a terminal entry here, we can read, quote, they finally found out and cut off our financing, end quote. Now, it's not clear from this exactly who found out what, but reading between the lines, it sounds as though Impala Automatics is nothing but a cover for another branch of Biotechnica. Perhaps this is even where the terrible virus which killed Red Ochre Clan was originally developed. And when Impala Automatics was quote unquote forced to shut down, it appears said branch of Biotechnica, still being armed to the teeth, opted to maintain residence here and just continue their experiments. Until we come along and take out everybody, that is. Additionally, one final reference to Joanne Coke I found outside the gig is back at the city centre, where a Biotechnica security team have been tasked with securing the area around the hotel in order to keep her secure. Presumably, they predict a large-scale assault from Red Ochre themselves, and not a highly skilled solo whose time is on the clock with some mental infiltration skills. So that's a bit, or I should say a lot, of padding around the game for this character, and now that we're informed on the atrocities this woman has committed, along with the huge corporate game of whack-a-mole she's been playing to keep said atrocities silent, we can, more appropriately, decide what to do with her. Letting her upload her research is literally just a ploy to run for security by the way, so this dialogue option doesn't really matter. However, there is a bit of a difference in whether you take her out lethally or non-lethally. See, as we're 19 floors up, carrying her to a fixer's car isn't exactly a straightforward thing to do. Fortunately, if we've cleared the roof of guards, this extraction method is a lot more creative and interesting than usual. We instead deposit coke in a ginormous drone-powered rubbish skip and fly her away like the trash she is to face the due justice of Red Ochre Clan. I mean, sure, we could take her out ourselves, but were it the Alder Caldos, I'd rather give them the satisfaction. Now, all we have to do is escape the hotel, which shouldn't be too tough if you've already carved a clear path in. Dino will give you a big congratulations, and with all the gigs done, we'll also be gifted one of the many variants of the Quadra 66. Now, I know I said we're done with the Joanne Coke references, but actually, there is one more that I know of. I wouldn't be surprised if there's others too, so comment below if I missed any. But back in the Westbrook 
Facebook video, I mentioned how the Olive Branch gig has a unique bit of Nomad dialogue for those that completed the guinea pigs gig before this one. It's clear from Alex Pushkin's dialogue just the kind of attitude that these biotechnical lots have towards the nomads that they got killed. Biotechnica, huh? Assuming you know Joanne Coke. I do, I do. I did a prim little project with her out in the Badlands. What about you? Yeah. Heard all about that project. Real triumph. Wonder how many from Red Ochre died. You recall? Uh, who can keep track? Besides, they're like roaches. Disgusting things will just multiply again. Not your lucky day after all. What? Did I say? Wait! We must have other mutual friends! Yeah, I think due to the sheer depth of references Joanne Coke gets in this game, she is easily one of Cyberpunk's most evil corporate scientists, and it goes to show that each corporation, in one form or another, is pretty much just downright horrible. As for guinea pig's ranking, I'm gonna name it, unsurprisingly, a very very well plotted out S tier gig. But as always, comment below any further connections you've found that I may have missed, and if you enjoyed this one then I now have videos for all the other district's gigs, save for Santo Domingo which is coming next. And I'll also be covering the Cyber Psychos and a bunch of other unsolved mysteries too, fairly soon in the future. Massive thank you to all my patrons whose names are on screen now for supporting the channel, and thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see See you soon in another video.